Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today we'll start on probably one of the most ambitious recording projects that I can come up with. And that involves a full reading with you and discussion of Edward Said's Orientalism. I know it's kind of a daunting project, but I think it's going to be really rewarding for me personally, but also for you, if we can read the whole book and talk about it. Now, in today's video, I will mostly be covering part one of the introduction. And then, as we progress, we'll read more and more of the book. But just part one of the introduction, which is four pages. And the way I will do it is I'll first read the text and then come back and talk to you. So I start with the two pithy epigrams of the book. I'll read them and then we'll talk about them. Two epigrams. The first one is a quote from Karl Marx, his essay, The Eighteenth Boromir of Louis Bonaparte. And the second one from Benjamin Desiree the British Prime Minister and from one of his books. So the first one, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented, comes from Karl Marx. And then the East is a career. I'll talk more about these two epigrams in a moment. Okay, so let's go over these epigrams, right? The first one from Marx, and the biggest critique of it is that Said is quoting it out of context, right? First of all, uh, Marx is writing about the small landholders in France who could not constitute a class and hence did not have political representation. And the whole idea was that they should take a patronym and Napoleon, Louis, Napoleon, Louis Bonaparte, should become the person who represents them as a father figure. So the quote is uh, kind of a lot of critics who have read the quote and Saeed's justification for using it have had problem with that. First of all, because it makes people think, people who have not read their Marx would, it makes them think that this is what Marx thought of the Oriental people themselves, which wasn't necessarily the case. And two, that within the context of the 18th Boromir of Louis Bonaparte, that what Marx is trying to theorize is how would these small landholders who cannot constitute a class be politically represented. So that's the first quote which is problematic. The quote from Desarelli comes from his third novel, a trilogy that he published in 1840s, and it was a utopia, right? And it, uh, this one comes from Tank, uh, from the novel Tancred, right? Uh, and in that, the nobleman who goes to the Holy Land to seek his fortune, uh, th so that imagination is there, that East is a career, right, for people who were tired of uh, materialism of Victorian England, right? And that is kind of an apt epigram because East, and a lot of critics who write about Orientalism would tell you that within the context of today's politics, East still, of course, is a career for a lot of people. Now that we have seen the second Gulf War and all that, we've also learned that East is also a career for a lot of contractors, defense contractors and everyone else. So that second quote, of course, applies to what Said is trying to do, uh, you know, in, in this book. Now, generally, while reading the introduction, another thing to keep in mind is, uh, and we will get to that in the later stage of this uh, video today, is that Orientalism is the first major academic book, at least coming from American Academy, that uses Foucault's theory of discourse. And Said says that in the last part of that introduction that we will read. But after this, let us see how does he start the book and what's contained in the introduction. So let us read a little more and then I'll come back 
and talk to you a little more about what we have read. It will be clear to the reader and will become clearer still throughout the many pages that follow that by Orientalism I mean several things, all of them, in my opinion, independent, interdependent. The most readily accepted designation for Orientalism is, is an academic one, and indeed the label still serves in a number of academic institutions. Anyone who teaches, writes about, or researches the Orient, and this applies whether the person is an anthropologist, sociologist, historian, or philologist, either in its specific or its general aspects, is an Orientalist, and what he or she does is Orientalism. Compared with Oriental studies or area studies, it is true that the term Orientalism is less preferred by specialists today, both because it is too vague and general and because it connotes the high-handed executive attitude of 19th century and early 20th century, European colonialism. Nevertheless, books are written and congresses held with the Orient as their main focus with the Orientalist in this new or old guise as their main authority. The point is that even if it does not survive as it once did, Orientalism lives on academically through its doctrines and theses about the Orient and the Oriental. Related to this academic tradition, whose fortunes transmigrations, specializations, and transmissions are in part the subject of this study is a more general meaning for Orientalism. Orientalism is a style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and, most of the time, the Occident. Thus a very large mass of writers, among whom are poets, novelists, philosophers, political theorists, economists, and imperial administrators, have accepted the basic distinction between East and West as the starting point for elaborate theories, epics, novels, social descriptions, and political accounts concerning the Orient, its people, customs, mind, destiny, and so on. This Orientalism can accommodate Aeschylus, say, and Victor Hugo, Dante, and Karl Marx. A little later in this inter introduction, I shall deal with the methodological problems one encounters in so broadly constructed a field as this. The interchange between the academic and the more or less imaginative meanings of Orientalism is a constant one. And since the late 18th century, there has been a considerable quite disciplined, perhaps even regulated, traffic between the two. Here I come to the third meaning of Orientalism, which is something more historically and materially defined than either of the other two. Taking the late 18th century as a very roughly defined starting point, Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as the corporate institution for dealing with the Orient, dealing with it by making statements about it authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, ruling over it. In short, Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. I have found it useful here to employ Michel Foucault's notion of a discourse as described by him in the Archaeology of Knowledge and in Discipline and Punish to identify Orientalism. My contention is that without examining Orientalism as a discourse, one cannot possibly understand the enormously systematic discipline by which European culture was able to manage and even produce the Orient politically, sociologically, militarily, ideologically, scientifically, and imaginatively during the post-Enlightenment period. Moreover, so authoritative a position did Orientalism have that I believe no one writing, thinking, or acting on the Orient could do so without taking account of the limitations on thought and action imposed by Orientalism. In brief, because of Orientalism, the Orient was not and is not a free subject of thought or action. This is not to say that Orientalism unilaterally determines 
what can be said about the Orient, but that it is the whole network of interests inevitably brought to bear on and therefore always involved in any occasion when the peculiar entity, the Orient, is in question. How this happens is what this book tries to demonstrate. It also tries to show that European culture gained in strength and identity by setting itself off against the Orient as a sort of surrogate and even underground self. So what I just read is probably one of the most important parts of this introduction because in this, Saeed is trying to describe three possible definitions of Orientalism, what he considers Orientalism. And then towards the end of what I just read is, in my opinion, and you might have seen my annotation there, which I placed there as a graduate student, thesis. Uh, he articulates the thesis of the book. So uh, what did we learn in this path, right? Uh, he gives us the general meaning of Orientalism, right, that anyone who teaches, writes about, writes poetry, administers, anyone who claims some degree of expertise, knowledge, affinity of the Orient can be called an Orientalist. Now, within the col colonial uh, domain, these would also be the people who were the administrators, right? And these would be the people who lived in the uh, or Oriental colonies. All of these actions or people are the ones he would call Orientalisms. Uh, basically, any set of feelings that sets up this ontological and epistemological difference between the Orient and the Occident. What is the ontological difference? Ontology deals with human existence. So any time someone thinks that these two categories have different kinds of existences as human beings, that's Orientalist. Epistemological about dealing with knowledge, so anyone who tries to explore the Orient, writes about it, claims expertise in it, could be called an Orientalist. Then he goes on to, um, to the academic Orientalism, which is the main subject of his uh, and academic Orientalism are people who call themselves Orientalists. There are Oriental conferences. There are still schools in Europe that call themselves schools of Oriental studies. These are people who consider themselves as experts in an established dis discipline of Oriental studies and have conferences produce books, right, and produce a body of knowledge. So these are the academic Orientalists. The second one is in the cultural sense, right? People who think of the Orient a certain way. And there is, according to Said, a lot of correspondence between the two. Of course, the academic Orientalism informs the popular views of the Orient and vice versa. And then the third part, which is crucial to the book, which he, in which he talks about Orientalism being as a corporate institution for dealing with the Orient. What does he mean by dealing with the Orient? Producing knowledge about it, administering it, right? Making it comprehensible to the Europeans, right? Making it intelligible to the Europeans. And this is where now we are going into his use of Michel Foucault and theory of discourse. Now, I strongly recommend that you should read, uh, and I'll post a link up there, my, oh no, not read, I mean, watch my video on colonial discourse, but as Foucault describes discourse, right, in Archaeology of Knowledge and two works that Said himself mentions, a discourse is a body of knowledge produced by experts who have institutional prestige behind them, which then creates an atmosphere, a discursive atmosphere, where without knowing it, we internalize the claims and logic of that discourse and see the world through it. The reason he is looking at the third, the Orientalism is a corporate institution because it had bodies of knowledge, universities, colonial enterprises, colonial administrators, writers, anthropologists, poets, 
constantly producing knowledge about the Orient. Knowledge so far deep that it becomes impossible for people to actually materially experience the Orient and know it. Think of it this way. Uh, I always use this example with my students. How does a discourse work? It predisposes you or overdetermines the way you think about things. If you buy a travel guide, you're going to Nepal, and you buy a travel guide, that travel guide discursively creates your desire, modulates it, and builds your expectations. If that's the only thing you have read about Nepal, when you get there, all you're doing is matching your experience with what you have read. So your experience then becomes meaningful only with reference to the text that informed you about the place that you're visiting. So in certain circumstances, the actual visitation doesn't even alter your views. It sanctifies your stereotypes. That's what he means by Orientalism as a corporate institution. And the reason he's also mentioning that is because that is the body of text that he's going to write about. Now, he tells us that there are different stages of it, right? 18th century representations of the Orient and then the 19th century representations of the Orient when the European powers already hold most of the Orient, right? And the bodies of work produced by writers, by the local administrators, are the ones that then shape the perception of the Orient in European imagination. But they also create the Orient as this other against which the Europeans can stabilize their own civilizational and individual identities. So that's what comes across to me in this part of the introduction. So let us read uh, the last part of introduction, part one, and then I'll come back and conclude this conversation. Historically and culturally, there is a quantitative as well as a qualitative difference between the Franco-British involvement in the Orient and until the period of American ascendancy after the World War II, the involvement of every other European and Atlantic power. To speak of Orientalism, therefore, is to speak mainly, although not exclusively, of a British and French cultural enterprise, a project whose dimensions take in such disparate realms as the imagination itself, the whole of India and the Levant, the biblical texts and the biblical lands, the spice trade, colonial armies, and a long tradition of colonial administrators, a formidable scholarly corpus innumerable oriental experts and hands, an oriental professorate, a, a complex array of oriental ideas, oriental despotism, oriental splendor, cruelty, sensuality, many eastern sects, philosophies, and wisdoms domesticated for local European use. The list can be extended more or less indefinitely. My point is that Orientalism derives from a particular closeness experience between Britain and France and the Orient, which until the early 19th century had really meant only India and the Bible lands. From the beginning of the 19th century until the end of World War II, France and Britain dominated the Orient and Orientalism. Since World War II, America has dominated the Orient and approaches it, and, and approaches it as France and Britain once did. Out of that closeness, whose dynamic is enormously productive, even if it always demonstra demonstrates the comparatively greater strength of the Occident, British, French, or American, comes the large body of text I call Orientalist. It should be said at, at once that even with the generous number of books and authors that I examine, there is a much larger number that I simply have had to leave out. My argument, however, depends neither upon an exhaustive catalog of texts dealing with the Orient, nor upon a clearly delimited set of texts, authors, and ideas that together make up the Orientalist canon. I have depended instead upon a different methodological alternative whose backbone, in a sense, is the set of historical generalizations I have so far been making in this introduction, and it is these I want now to discuss in more analytical detail.
Okay, so this was the last part of part one of the introduction that I just read. And before I go into it, I would like to also, I forgot to mention the thesis that I thought as a graduate student was the thesis of the book, which was in the previous reading segment. And I would like to read it and talk about it a bit more. And it's on page three. And this is, this is not to say that Orientalism unilaterally determines what can be said about the Orient but that it is the whole network of interest inevitably brought to bear on any occasion when that peculiar entity, the Orient, is in question. How this happens is what this book tries to demonstrate. It also tries to show that European, cultures, European culture gained in strength and identity by setting itself off against the Orient as a sort of surrogate and even underground self. So what he's trying to say is that, look, one part of this book, one project is to, to explain how is the place of the Orient overdetermined by discourses? Why do the Europeans see it the way? What's its integral importance to the European self-presentation and self-construction as a culture? And that is one project of the book. Then what I just read, I think what came across clearly is he telling us that, OK, early 18th century and 19th century, the Orient was India and the Levant, but it expanded further because of the integral relationship and closeness in the colonial sense of France and Britain to these areas. And that is why what he's saying is, I am restricting my study to French and British colonial occupation of the Orient and their imagination of it. And America is a subject of study, but probably not in this book. Okay. Then what he goes on to say towards the end of this part of the uh, introduction, which, you know, is, uh, is the role of America since World War II about the other Orient, the Far East. And that is an important part of study, too, but not necessarily part of this book. But then, of course, there is a bit of a hedging. What he's saying here is, OK, I'm not giving you an exhaustive account of the text that I have read. Right? I've selected certain British and French texts over 300 years that I'm going to read. The point is not even to say that these are the quintessential texts. What he's saying is the point is that I've made cert certain generalizations about Europe, that their administrative documents, their romances, their ways of looking at this, they are all part of a general discourse of the Orient that predisposes the Europeans to see the Orient a certain way powerful to a point that people can't really experience the Orient as it is in its material condition, and that that was not an accident. Orient was propped up discursively as a place that could be used as this other to stabilize the European self. And this is the point that he's saying he's making a lot of generalizations about. And part two of the introduction, he's saying, OK, let me now explain these generalizations to you. And so that's where he goes in part two of the introduction, which we'll talk about in the next lecture in this series. So as I said earlier, this is an ambitious project. I don't know when it will end. But to me, as always, I think the journey, as cliche as it is, is the more significant part of our efforts. So please come and join me in this journey. And the best way you can support this venture is by actually watching the videos, right, reading the text with me, but also by commenting and posting your questions, your suggestions, your ideas if I'm reading something wrong because, I mean, the part of me, the process is for me also to learn from you. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you so much for being a part of this experience. And if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel. And also, on a side note, please do visit our learning website, uh, masudraja.com, and see what kind of courses are we developing over there. I could use your support there. Thank you so much. I will see you next time. And until then, peace and love.